Hey, Caitlin, thanks for the introduction and hello to everyone out there. Um, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I'm Chris Palmieri and I'm a business development manager for EV Box. And I work every day tirelessly to help clients and customers um, or partners rather uh, with fleet or excuse me with EV charging, implementing their EV charging solutions. And um, we're really excited to talk about fleet electrification here today. So the goal of why we're here, why we're presenting is we simply want to kind of offer an abridged roadmap to fleet electrification. Uh, everyone's going to have their own path, their own solutions, their own step-by-step -step process. But today's goal is just to provide an overview um, with some thoughts and considerations, maybe some steps to take to really get you going and take those first steps to electrifying your fleet. Um, it's very clear that fleet management and EV charging are merging basically together to really provide a more complete service or solution portfolio for clients. So in that regard, EV Box has partnered up with Momentum Groups, which is a forward-thinking fleet management company, really focused on electrification. So Jack Pyros will be joining us soon. He's the president of Momentum Groups, and um, he'll be able to provide some of his perspective on, on fleet electrification as well. So we'll, what we're gonna do is we're going to give brief overviews of our company, uh, both EV Box and Momentum Group, and then we're going to dive into our electrification portion of the presentation. So, basically, for those that don't know, EV Box is um, really a, an innovative solution provider offering innovative, intelligent, and future proof software and um, AC and DC fast charging uh, products. Uh, EV, EV Box has been in business for about 10 years. And throughout the 10 years, we've installed over 150,000 charging points, as you can see on the next slide. Um, we have installation and maintenance ongoing in over 70 countries around the world. And also uh, financially, um, we're, we're backed by NG which is one of the largest energy service companies um, in the world at around $70 billion a year in revenue. So in North America specifically, for everyone listening who's in North America, we're very excited. We just opened up a brand new manufacturing and um, North American headquarters facility in Libertyville, Illinois. And it's really exciting because over the next, um, four to six months, we're gonna transition into having all of our newest level two and DC fast chargers being American made with American made steel, which is pretty exciting. What we're seeing in the, to kind of bring us back into the fleet electrification and why everything is coming to a head right now is just simply, there's so many more options. Every auto manufacturer is investing heavily in electric vehicles. I won't read all these here, you can read them on your own, but uh, there's some really substantial investments going on. So for your fleet, depending on what kind of needs you have, there will probably be a vehicle either available today or in the near future. So uh, Thank you for letting me share a little bit of time uh, discussing EV Box. What I'd like to do now is introduce Jack Pyros, the president of Momentum Groups. Jack. Thank, thank you, Chris. Yeah, there you go. I appreciate it. Welcome, everybody. Um, at Momentum Groups, our mission is to offer companies best-in-class fleet vehicle solutions, typically enjoyed by large global fleets. Right now, the top global fleets are going through their electrification process as we speak. Companies like UPS and Amazon have committed to tens of thousands of electric vans from companies like Arrival and Rivian. Anheuser-Busch has partnered with the parent company of EV Box, NG, to deploy the largest fleet of Class 8 trucks in North America. 
These leaders are on a mission to eliminate carbon emissions, decrease their operating expenses, and make their business more competitive. Momentum Groups is committed to bringing these same opportunities and benefits to our clients. Every one of our clients has different needs, so we have a model that allows us to customize our fleet services to meet them. We can help fleets by providing an a la carte, ser a la carte services that they need rather than pressuring them to engage in all of our services like traditional fleet management companies do. The recent and upcoming availability of electric fleet vehicles has drawn us to the challenge of becoming the industry leader in electric vehicle procurement strategies and solutions for our clients. Our current relationships today include Lordstown Motors, set to release the first fleet truck in 2021, Tesla, who we all know, and EV Box, one of the top charging and storage companies in the world. Our partnerships allow momentum to provide turnkey electric fleet solutions to our clients today. This is a little bit of an overview of our, of our services. Um, and at Momentum Groups, we offer everything from procurement of vehicles through to assisting with vehicle disposal. A couple of important services with respect to EVs are we don't require deposits when ordering vehicles. We can provide realistic um, delivery times for planning and budgeting purposes. And um, we also provide financing to companies, so at the which at the time, Tesla and Lordstown Motors do not have anything in place for, for financing on a purchase or lease um, vehicles to companies. And our charging relationship, of course, with EV Box. Now that you know a little bit more about EV Box and Momentum Groups, let's get into how to incorporate EVs in your fleet. Step one, define your fleet. Almost every decision you make in your electrification process will be influenced by how your company and drivers will use their electric vehicles. Defining your electric vehicle fleet needs today and in the future provides the foundation for your decision-making when selecting vehicles and solution partners to assist in implementing your new EV strategy. Some key questions to consider when replacing your fleet with electric vehicles include, are there predictable routes um, providing a home base for charging? Is the vehicle covering a general territory needing you to identify ever-changing charge points along the way? Um, or do you have a long haul type route requiring potentially mobile charging or charging along the way? Multiple drivers assigned to one vehicle is becoming more common with the rising cost of equipment, regulatory mandates recently put in place and customers demands for fast shipment, shipment times. This poses a question, are you gonna need fast charging and EV management as part of your solution? This gives you a little bit of a snapshot and I'm sure you'll see some familiar vehicles um, on the slide, but currently there are electric vehicle options for um, compact cars, sedans and crossovers. And promise next year there are SUVs coming out, pickup trucks and cargo vans. There are many different manufacturers who are producing electric vehicles in each with a different maintenance requirement and technology integrations that you will need to consider when looking to manage an electrified fleet of vehicles. I wanted to highlight a few of the upcoming fleet vehicles for 2021. This is the Tesla Cybertruck. It has work truck power, a charged range of 500 miles, and according to Tesla, 80% of their vehicles Maintenance can be achieved remotely through software refresh upgrades, rarely needing the vehicle to be brought into a repair center for service. 80% is, is quite impressive. You can see why we're drawn and passionate about our commitment to a strong electrification turnkey solution. Lordstown Motors has started production of the endurance work truck, which you see above. Their purchase of the once GM plant in Lordstown, Ohio, gives them the ability to produce over 200 vehicles per year. This has really put them out in the forefront of, um, of having a plant with that kind of production capacity. Um, in 2021, they're one of the only companies with that, that kind of a facility in hand. Endurance is scheduled to be available mid-year 2021 with best-in-class four-wheel drive handling and zero emissions while touting a huge savings and cost of ownership. 
The first 20,000 vehicles are pre-sold and Momentum Groups is scheduled to have 900 of these vehicles available next year. Jack, what kind of timelines are associated with, with electric vehicle procurement versus traditional gas or diesel trucks? How, how's that gonna change the procurement process? Well, right now, you know, if you're not going through somebody like, like us, you're, you're basically gonna put the order in and you really aren't gonna get any kind of a, of a, of a set delivery date. To give you an idea, even with the pandemic, um, which shut down plants, you know, the big three and everybody else, we're still able to turn vehicles in two to three months. So um, number one, going through like a website, you're just gonna be kind of thrown in there with everybody else, in, inclu including consumer demand or retail demand. And um, what I've noticed is that because of, because of the, you know, the ramping up of, of production, these manufacturers are committing large volumes to companies willing to buy large volumes. So First Energy, Amazons of the world, UPS, and even just large privately held companies have stepped up and committed 500, 1,000 a piece. So for example, Lordstown Motors capacity next year is about 20,000 units. They're gonna ramp up. But point being is that, that, that the first 20,000 they make, which is gonna be at least another six months, six to nine months is already spoken for. So that's gonna be, the combination of, of, of those two things is gonna, is gonna definitely push some of that back. So if you're looking to do something like, uh, if you're looking to get into electric vehicles next year, you're gonna wanna start talking now about what options are out there and get your, you know, get your orders in through, through fleet. Yeah. Thanks, Jack. This is a, um, Lorsum provided a side-by-side a -side comparison with the Ford F-150 Lariat. So these are basically like, similarly equipped, they, they both run around 52,000. So it, it's got some nice features and options in it. The vehicle costs being the same and the endurance when driven on an average of 20,000 miles per year has a third of the cost of fuel and maintenance as does the Ford F-150. Um, at the end of the five years, this is a savings of a total of $20,000 per vehicle, which is you know, unheard of. And if you think about a hundred vehicle fleet, for example, you'd be saving approximately $2 million over a five-year period you know, going right to your bottom line, which is very impressive. Jack, is there, um, I, I, people have been telling me, at least from the OEM side, mm -hmm. that their vehicle life expectancy is supposed to be considerably longer. Do you have any insight into how that plays in terms of ROI? Sure, that's, that's a, a great question because that's really not calculated on this, on this comparison. Um, we look at roughly 100 to 120,000 miles for a fleet vehicle, meaning a gas vehicle is, is about its, its useful life. Not, then you're getting into like the repair cars, costs are outweighing, you know, rotating that vehicle out. So with somebody driving around 20,000 miles a year, you're looking at like a four to five year lifespan for just say an F-150 um, in, in our world. And the, um, the endurance and, and a lot of other electric vehicles, you're looking at more of like a 10 year window where you can put 200,000 um, up to you know, easily a half a million miles on these vehicles. So over a 10 year period, you'd have to do two of the F-150s and only one of the endurances. So that's a huge factor. Um, kind of something I didn't, I don't know that it, this slide really touches on it, but your average chassis for like say a, a Ford GM or, or Ram truck has about 4,000 or more mo moving parts. The endurance, um, they claim it has about, it has under 400 moving parts. So that kind of leads into the savings and maintenance and the longevity of it. Um, last, I'd say that on the endurance and, and a lot of them, a lot of these vehicles, EVs like the, like the endurance, there is a 10 year warranty on the battery. Step one is um, defining your fleet. Fleet size, locations, and growth rate are, are gonna be top, top considerations when um, starting to think about the process of, of, of transitioning over. The size of your fleet is gonna be a major factor when considering EV charging solutions and energy requirements. As your fleet gets larger, so does the demand for electricity, obviously. Um, you may need to consider energy solutions, perhaps that include even solar and battery storage depending on how large your demand is and, and 
what kind of service, electrical service is available to you at your location. Um, multiple fleet means not only multiple charge points, but multiple charge location strategies, and they could vary. You might have a sales office with cars and they take them home every night, and then you've got a, a distribution center that you're running two shifts and they're, they're just pumping out steel or, or you know, pallets or products. So um, looking across all of your locations, you're gonna have, you're gonna have different strategies there um, and obviously need to, to fully encompass, encompass that from a management level. Um, what is your fleet looking like today and what, what do you forecast it will look like in three, five, or 10 years. Very important. Um, your, your ability to charge and, and the service that you need today with two or five vehicles as you expand could greatly change, the strategy can, can greatly change as you, as you go to 10, 20, and, and, you know, and or more, more vehicles. Uh, plan your charging infrastructure strategy around where you plan to be in the future. Building in a buffer today will allow you to absorb as your EV fleet grows, so that your growth rate does not outpace your charging infrastructure. Yeah, and, and Jack, I think, you know, to touch on that just for a little bit, um, we're kind of, we, we see a lot of, you know, a lot of people considering fleet electrification and they look at the numbers of chargers they might need as like a finite number that they'll, they'll purchase them, they'll install them, and then we're done. The reality is, is that businesses seem to change all the time. Fleets increase, they decrease, they move locations. So to have like a fleet service provider and a EV charging service provider working together with your company to really plan a strategy and, and, and adapt your growth rate and your installation timelines and evaluate your uses through data analytics is gonna be really important. Absolutely. Next slide, please. Where will EVs park and for how long? You got to ask yourself some questions when you're, you know, some additional questions when you're looking at, at, at the scope of this, of, this, uh, of this introduction of an EV fleet. Do your drivers, for example, take the vehicles home or do they return the vehicle back to the corporate facility. If drivers take their vehicles home, you may want to consider an at-home charging solution integrated with the, the, the vehicle lease itself, for example. Um, duration of time between uses. Delivery trucks might make multiple routes per day and only have 30 minutes back at the distribution center to reload. Similarly, a taxi or ride share profits every minute the vehicle is moving. It's not making you any money when it's standing still. Um, so in both of these cases, Perhaps DC fast charging would be more of an ideal solution for that, that type of a use. You may find that your best strategy uses a combination, perhaps, of both AC charging and DC fast charging. Step two is developing your solution team. After you define your fleet, it's now time to develop your team to ensure your electrification program functions smoothly with flexible and future-proof solutions. There are multiple partners that you're going to want to invite to your strategy roundtable discussions. Together, these partners will coordinate schedules for site inspections, energy audits, and engineering designs, EV charging strategy, EV charging procurement, installation timelines, electric service upgrades, electric vehicle delivery, perhaps funding solutions, um, software integration, and more. Uh, it seems like a lot, and it is. A strong team can coordinate all of these items to ensure you're seamlessly electrifying your fleet. Your solutions partner should also help you avoid roadblocks or pitfalls along the way. For example, it would be very uncomfortable and unfortunate to order a fleet of vehicles only to find out after the fact that your facility cannot supply enough power to charge them and, and therefore there's no, you know, you can't use them at least at the time. Yeah, Jack, that's a, that's a, that's a real world problem. I have a customer of mine that um, reached out to us because the board of directors of this shipping company uh, asked the fleet manager to acquire or procure four electric trucks because they wanted to electrify their fleet. They showed up and they didn't have any means to charge them and they have no, and no software integration to, manage anything so 
it's really important to kind of take those into consideration. Yeah, that's a great point. And I think we've talked, Chris, a little bit about, um, you know, you may not own your building. You may have the flexibility to move. You may find that uh, you're, you're a, a last mile delivery company and you've got a, a building with power to, to satisfy computers and lights. And all of a sudden now you want to you wanna charge those 10 trucks and you want to charge them fast because they're moving and delivering, you know, 16 hours a day. So you got a little bit of a challenge there. And maybe you talk to your utility and you can't bring that power. The infrastructure doesn't allow you to bring that power into the building. So you definitely want to look ahead at these things and, and make sure you plan so you don't run into run into that problem. Um, there we go. You want to make sure you have an experienced EV charging and solution provider at the table. When assembling your team for fleet electrification, you'll need to integrate charging infrastructure into your solutions. It's important to choose a, char a charging solutions provider who will help support all of your infrastructure needs as your business changes over time. You want to choose a partner that believes in bring your business and innovative hardware and software solutions. And I can tell you firsthand when I, I started to look into this, um, there's a lot out there. You can Google, you can look on places like Amazon and there's, there's you know, what I would call retail units. You know, you definitely want to get reliable equipment. You want to have the options of equipment that some, if you need to tie software to them. Um, so you really, you really want to work with a partner, a charging solutions partner that um, has the full range of products, has the forward thinking, as the integration and, and you know, it goes, it goes on and on, but um, that, that can be a, a game changer um, and decide between your, you know, your success or failure in this endeavor. I need to go back one slide. There you go. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Choosing your fleet service provider. Yep. So we just talked about the fleet service provider with the flexibility, which was great, Jack. Um, we, we skipped, uh, Chris, we skipped one. We got to go back to fleet service provider. Okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay, as well as an as EV charging provider, your fleet service provider needs to have a real commitment to electric vehicles by having established partnerships with not only electric vehicle OEMs, but a solid relationship with an experienced EV manufacturing and charging solutions provider. Together, they should be in alignment on technology, supply chain, schedules, driver and fleet manager support, and software integration. As a team, they will be able to monitor usage and manage, manage data analytics. This proactive management approach will allow them to quickly integrate new strategies and custom solutions needed to ad adapt to your ever-changing fleet and business needs. Jack, for a lot of fleets out there, I mean, we all hear about like the Amazons, the UPS, FedEx, they're all these huge fleets, but I would imagine most of the fleet size in, in North America might be a little bit smaller, more of like a medium or small size fleet. Are there financial, like what are some of the financial, you know, solutions kind of alle alleviate that, that upfront burden for both like either hardware or, or for the vehicles themselves? Sure. Um, the lion's share of, of fleets out there fall between, let's say for example, 25 to, Two three hundred vehicles. There's a, there's, that's a large segment of, of fleets that are operated, and, and really even larger um, are the number of companies that are under twenty five vehicles. So great question. Um, rebates and tax credits and things of that nature are out there. Um, they're they're uh, they're state by state, and also it can be by utility company. I know that for example, EV Box has um, some good data on what's out there and can quickly put you in touch with those kinds of of rebates and tax credits that are out there. So that would be that would be a good starting point because those can be huge dollars. On the endurance, you saw it was 
you know, seventy thousand dollars per vehicle in terms of a, a tax credit, which is huge. Um, when, in addition to, go ahead, Chris. I was going to say, from from like the equipment, is it possible to tie that into your vehicles as well, or not yet? Sure, sure. So we do both. Um, in our case, we do both a, a financed purchase or a financed lease. In either case, we have the ability to incorporate the vehicle charging. You know, depending on the situation, but the vehicle charging in along with that lease. So just like a vehicle lease, you're paying for the equipment as you use it. Um, and of course, we've got other funding out there that is for um, charging equipment and you know, off-road tr trucks and things of that nature where we set up a block of money and that can be utilized. So there are definitely options out there for the equipment, for the charging um, units as well as, as, well as vehicles. Um, in addition to that, we're, uh, we're involved in, and it is out there that you can, you can acquire charging provided as a service. So what that means is instead of you as a fleet uh, or as a, a fleet manager or as a company um, having to be concerned about the financial burden of the charging equipment, um, you can actually have an arrangement where you're paying for the service as you go. And that can be calculated by uh, paying a cost per mile that that charged vehicle is driven or a you know, a fixed arrangement, a monthly fee for the equipment, service, and software for charging. So great question, Chris. Perfect. And you, and you manage, I believe we talked to you, you were talking about, um, about, about getting electric vehicles serviced and like mm -hmm. the same, I mean, do they still have certain things like tires and brakes that they need to worry about, or is it a little bit less? How's it differ and how do they get their vehicle serviced? Sure. So our, our maintenance management programs, what we would have is um, an access through an app where, uh, where agreed upon locations can service electric vehicles. So there is service out there, it varies by manufacturer. Um, Tesla, for example, has their own service centers. The Endurance Lordstown Motors vehicle is gonna be partnering with an, a, a nationwide, uh, at least one nationwide service provider, somebody like, I don't want to say a Firestone, but somebody who already has a nationwide footprint and um, they have not announced who that's, that's going to be yet. But on the management side, it's important for that to be very easy. In terms of what kind of things, going from 4,000 moving parts down to 400, you're still going to have, you're not going to have oil, um, but and you're not going to have brake fluid and you're not going to have belts, but you're going to have potentially uh, 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 windshield washer fluid, right? and you're gonna need tires and you might need to have those tires checked. So it's gonna be a little different in terms of the maintenance items, but there still is going to be um, some maintenance items. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you've got a system or a plan in place through yourself or through somebody like, like us to, to take care of and cover um, and manage the maintenance of the vehicles. Perfect, well, thanks Jack. For everyone listening, um, for assembling your team, it's really important and Jack, just covered, you know, really wanting to include your EV charging, you know, ser service provider and your fleet service provider as well. Um, I'm going to take the lead on the next couple of ones because they're in our wheelhouse here. Um, the the next one that you're the next person that you're going to really want at your table uh, is the your local utility representative. Um, each utility throughout you know, the North America or throughout the US um, has a different level of incentives available. Some might not have any quite yet. Others have tremendous incentives. Um, here's an example. Uh, PG&E, uh, one of the larger utilities in, in, out in California, uh, just recently acquired or procured uh, over 2,000 chargers from EV Box. And what they're doing right now is offering 50% off the cost of all new EV charging stations in a fleet application. And on top of that, for like electric vehicles, I think it's a few thousand dollars per vehicle that they're offering up as well, specifically again for fleet electrification. Um, so have your utility representative at the table. They're also gonna be um, able to determine you know, your power limitations, what kind of power supply upgrades you might need or service upgrades, and um, just be a, 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 a tremendous amount of, of knowledge 
regarding all the electrical aspects of your fleet and your property. Uh, you're also definitely going to want to have your fleet manager, your sustainability manager, and your facility manager all sitting down at the table with you. Um, with the, in respect to the fleet manager, the fleet manager is going to know the real ins and outs of the daily operation of your fleet. Uh, we might think we have ideas and solutions, but until we actually have inside knowledge on how your specific fleet works and the demands and requirements associated with your fleet manager, we're not going to be able to provide the best service. So by all means, have your fleet manager involved. Um, your facility manager, he's also, that person's going to be able to help us understand um, power limitations at your facility. Uh, also real world applications in terms of where the charger is going to be installed. Right, can we load them all up against the building? Do they have to be in a new location? Um, you know, definitely different things to think about. Uh, also, from a sustainability and facility standpoint, you may need to incorporate a microgrid solution. You know, if you have five or 10 cars or trucks, it's probably not that big of a deal. But if you're starting to turn over 20, 30, 50, hundreds of vehicles at one location, you're probably gonna have to consider some supplement, um, supplemental power through like solar and battery storage. Um, these all should be part of the equation right from the start. So your full electric, uh, your electrification process can be as smooth as possible. Now for step three, this is where I'd really ask everyone to kind of slow down a little bit because we want to develop EV charging requirements and strategy. Uh, a lot of people think of requirements as being very specific, detailed lists of things that need to be checked off. For this purpose, I think of requirements as being more broad stroke approach and thought process to make sure that you prevent issues in the future. So, um, you know, if we go and we look at the first requirement that I that we come up with, it's make sure that you have flexibility to switch between software providers, all right? There's a lot of different software service providers out there and all of them have different features and price points. And just like your business over time changes, you're also gonna wanna be able to adapt. You might wanna reduce your costs because you don't need so many features and you could change to a software service provider at a lower cost. Or perhaps you need a lot more features because you went from a fleet of 100 to 10 or 20 locations of 1,000 vehicles. Um, basically, what the software can do, all right, what the software really does is it helps with connectivity. First of all, connectivity with all of the chargers so you can manage them. You'll be able to collect data analytics. You'll be able to see um, if your chargers are online or if they're offline, if there's an issue. You're, Facility manager can get an alert that there's a specific charger on property number two that needs attention. Um, at a very base level, that's, that's your basic software. But as it gets more elaborate, you might need to integrate software into like your fleet management system, your driver schedules. You might want to schedule specific vehicle charging based on the departure time or the departure schedule of all of your fleet drivers. You're definitely going to want to consider integrating energy savings features such as like smart queuing or load balancing things you might not need to become experts now but just be aware that all of these type of concepts exist and you want to be able to use them it's going to save your company a lot of money uh, long term the second priority or requirement that i would suggest is that you Incorporate OCPP, and for you listening for the first time or hearing OCPP, what it means is Open Charge Point Protocol. It's interoperability between all of your hardware and software providers, with the ability to switch between different hardware and software over time. Um, you could probably imagine investing thousands and thousands of dollars on infrastructure, and then having a service provider either go out of business or they try to raise their rates, or maybe you just found something else that 
was better suited for your business from a price point or from a feature aspect. Protect your business so in the future, you can change out different hardware, different software, and be secure knowing that you're protected um, from stranded assets. And, and by stranded assets, it just simply means if you use, on the other hand, right, if you use proprietary software and hardware solutions, and you invested in this, and you're running with it, and then that company tries to raise their rates, or they go out of business, or, or you're not happy with their service, you literally will have to rip and replace your entire investment. Don't put that on the line. Protect yourself in the future. Chris, I have a question for you. When I kind of started this journey looking into electric vehicles and charging, I had some conversations with, with charging service providers, whether it be companies that manufacture chargers or provide service. And they, they said something to the effect that, yeah, we're, you know, they're throwing it around. We're OCPP compliant, I think is the term they used, or we have OCPP potential. Can you explain what the difference is? Yeah. Um, a lot of companies say they might be OCPP, uh, but you really need to ask them to sh show some proof. Are they integrated with multiple service providers? Do you have multiple service providers use their hardware? Um, you really want to make sure that it's an easy transition and not like a month, month or six month process to get integration. Um, I, or pay I feel, for it. Or yeah, have to or pay, pay for, it. for it. Yeah, you know, and and if it's not part of their business model, it's kind of far fetched to think that they're going to spend all that time and energy to help out a customer who's leaving them. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how much uphill battle do you really want to? avoid that's that's part of it so uh, yep so to go along with ocpp you really want to use future proof and intelligent hardware um you know just as a general rule of thumb your business always changes so always build in some forms of uh, flexibility uh, I always go back to the small, smaller business with like 10 vans, right? You start, you start your, your business, you, you get a couple, you get 10 electric vans and you just need to maybe install two, four, six chargers. And it's on one property in your driveway. You really don't necessarily need software to service or management of those hardware. It could just be basic plug and charge. But after a few years, you get up to 20 or 30 vehicles or multiple locations, by all means, you need to incorporate software to manage everything and oversee everything. With flexible and intelligent hardware, you're gonna be able to just modify the hardware that you've already invested in. You're not gonna to have to replace all your hardware to get smart hardware. So you can simply just upgrade or downgrade over time um, based on what your business needs are. Uh, and then uh, similarly, the intelligent part of the hardware is that you can in fact incorporate software solutions and use features like hub satellite configuration for load balancing, smart queuing, um, peak demand shaving, all sorts of energy efficient um, charging solutions to help reduce costs over time. Now, step four, you're going to want to make sure you have ongoing support. And you're also going to have some other considerations that you're going to want to look at. Um, for the ongoing support portion, you know, if you're a fleet manager and you just need some chargers, a lot of people might have that basic thought, right? Like I need to procure some charging equipment, who's the cheapest and call it a day. The reality is, is that as your business grows, you're going to need ongoing support, ongoing service. Um, you'll need, you know, we can just start here. You need installation and commissioning services. You're also going to want ongoing education services, whether it's online or perhaps on-site visits, you know, from techs. And realistically, your employees turn over, so you're always going to want to have that education in place to help maintain and um, increase the knowledge of, of everyone involved in your fleet electrification process. 
the education keeps on going though. Realistically, we can use data analytics. Um, Jack with Momentum Group can use fleet vehicle insights. And together, we can really determine the best way to, or the most efficient way to charge vehicles and manage uh, your fleet growth over time. Um, it, you'll be able to learn how to be more efficient and save more money over time as well. Uh, so field support is also really important. You're, you wanna make sure you have that in place. Uh, we also could probably talk about managed services. Jack, I think the reason why you know, Momentum Groups is even in business is because every company can't have their own fleet division. They need help. They need managed services from you. Same thing right. applies to the EV charging hardware. Um, and that goes for operation services, you know, managed services, operation services, very similar. Um, you know, yeah, just to, just to, and just to add in there quickly, um, so you've got your fleet, you, you've got your traditional fleet or your gas fleet, and then you add electric, right? So maybe before you had 25 or 50 vehicles, let's say, and, and, and you could kind of handle it, companies start to like need help with, with managed services at 25 plus vehicles. Once they get to 50, 75 to 100, they've, they, they're either gonna hire a fleet manager or gonna need somebody like, like ourselves. When you add now electric vehicles, it's a whole different kind of ball game, but you wanna integrate all that information. So when you look at like my fleet and you, and you wanna look at, you know, what is my cost per gallon? What, 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 how's my fleet doing miles per gallon? Are they making good choices when they charge? or when they put gas in, doesn't matter. It's either way, you wanna be able to have those data feeds too. So um, yep. for the sake of yeah. time, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> um, and then one of the last final considerations, and I see this all the time, I wanna prepare everyone, it's your timelines, all right? What you wanna, the biggest consideration you need to keep in mind is all the timelines for everything we kind of mentioned. It's gonna take time to integrate software and get people trained. It's gonna take a, the timeline to procure a vehicle is gonna be completely different than the timeline to procure your infrastructure and get that all set up. You know, um, pay attention to your timelines and, and the team that you have in place should be able to coordinate all of this to kind of make it a seamless transition. But it's a lot, and, but it can be very rewarding if we all work together and do it right. Um, Chris, last so, question on this last slide. Um, yep. I mean, before we get into a couple other things to and and questions, what's what is it? How long does it take on average for a company to from calling you up and saying, "I need a, a charging solution. This is what I want to do." How long does it take for them to get that in place so that they know that they're ahead of the vehicle being delivered to their to their business? Yeah. So I'll just touch on like general. EV charging projects right now, not fleet specific, just in general, if we're included right from the start, it could easily be three or four months down the road until the entire project is complete and installed, right? Because we have to go through site surveys, we need to get um, engineering drawings, we need to get, uh, uh, we need to procure and produce the product and get it delivered, shipped, installed. So it takes some time. And when you think about fleet electrification, if you have the goal as a fleet manager, that if you're just thinking, wait, I, I want electric cars, I'm buying electric cars, they're gonna arrive here uh, June, June 15th. Now I need to figure out how to accommodate them. That's gonna be a, that's gonna be a challenge. You, you wanna kind of incorporate everything from the start. So it can take anywhere from four months to as many, as much as, 12, depending on how complex the, what's, in, what's involved. And yeah, from start, from start to finish, like of this journey that we spelled out, you know, of coming up with your original, you know, strategy, having, developing your team, including all these timelines to prep and get ready. Yeah, it could be anywhere from, you know, three to 10 months or so. And, and obviously, it really depends on the scope and the size of the project, um, how elaborate it is. You know, if you just install a few chargers for your small fleet, I, I should take back a little bit of that timeline. It could just be a few weeks, right? It's, it's, not that, it's not that challenging. But as you get much larger, you're implementing programs for larger, medium to larger size fleets or 
Maybe you're incorporating battery storage and solar programs to help support your or fast home. charging, fast charging, yeah. yep. more demand, yep. more power demand. Yeah, exactly right. You, Thank you. You want to extend those timelines out a little bit. Um, so, so with that in mind, what we're going to do is um, we're going to transition to the questions portion of the of the webinar here. Uh, I hope I provided, I hope both Jack and I provided um, some positive insight for everyone to kind of help you understand the full scope of fleet electrification. If any of you guys right now, if you have any questions or thoughts or you'd like to add to this presentation in any way, feel free to type in the chat and um, we, can, we can kind of go into the question section. Um, Jack, there's one question here in particular. Uh, are there any lease programs for equipment purchased which will include the installation? Good question. Um, yes, we are able to provide a, a total price installed and we do have multiple funding options, whether for purchase or lease that would include the, the equipment installed. As, as, a, as a total up and ready solution. Yeah, and typically charging as a service incorporates that as well. Correct, it does. Yeah, you might, you might see, you might have a, nego a, a little bit of a longer term negotiated agreement or terms. Mm -hmm. if, you know, you include this because there's an upfront cost that you wanna spread out over time. So you might right. consider that. Right, usually like with, with even with vehicles, there's, there's a lot of times there's a um, there's some consideration for additional things like let's say an upfit where you're adding a chassis to it. So even though that's kind of like a little bit of a one-off strange thing, we do have we do have wiggle room there. So my point is yes to answer that question. Um, I see another question here. Most of our members are small companies. Does this make mm -hmm. sense for someone with only two or three vehicles? I'm assuming in, you're talking about fleet electrification in general. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Jack. Yeah, absolutely. If you've got a um, if you've got a delivery truck, it's just one or two trucks, and those trucks need fast charging. Um, let's say you're, you're just you're delivering bagels and you're delivering all, them all day and all night. Um, you're a bagel maker. <laughs> um, that truck needs to be running across a couple of shifts. So you've got your morning shift. Driver gets done, the truck's there for an hour or so, and the next person's starting at three o'clock and they're delivering till eight o'clock. You're gonna need to have fast charging, which is anywhere, Rick, tell me Chris if I'm off, but 30 minutes or less, let's say, to get a full charge or to really recharge that vehicle. You don't have the option to go overnight. Well, in that circumstance, there's a lot of draw on a fast charger and you're gonna need the same things. You're gonna need to have your panel looked at, potentially you need to beef up your panel, add some more, um, uh, service to it and the install so absolutely there's a there's a strategy and then monitoring it too not all chargers have you know software and brains to them where you can actually monitor and check at night and see is my charger up and running you know there might be a storm you want to show up the next day and find that you know the vehicle isn't charged and ready to go great question yeah, yeah so uh, if I add to that a little bit like for a smaller fleet of maybe two or three vehicles What's, what's really nice about this whole industry shift, I have to, uh, I, it's one of my favorite things, is like, you don't need scalability to make it work. You don't need to be a UPS and do 10,000 vans to get this ROI to happen. When you just make a shift, uh, even if it's just one vehicle or three vehicles, you get the immediate savings and ROI from electrifying that one truck and those one or two chargers. Um, so it, that's a good question. It's scalable and it, and everyone gets to reap the rewards from it. Um, let's see. Uh, I have a question, Jack, have you ever considered to develop a second life program for chargers? Uh, reuse the charger if a customer stops his lease or no longer needs the hardware. Sure. Kind of going back to what I was talking about. Let's say you, you lease your building. So you're you're there for a while, and and we've leased we've leased the equipment to you as as um, as a service, or or just lease it to you in general. Um, your needs change, 
but those those devices are are working perfectly we can we can repurpose them and the way that the lease would be structured is we're going to basically uh amortize it down so that it's it's kind of running with what it's worth so we could turn around and and offer it on a, on a pre-owned uh basis to another customer great question um let's see there's a few there's quite a there's some few uh questions here i'm just kind of reviewing them a little bit um Is charger service normally allowed in power company rebates? So I, I'm thinking if you're if I'm thinking you're asking about like a utility incentive for EV chargers. If that's if that's the if that's the case, then yes. Um, but every utility has their own unique um, incentives. Even in Massachusetts, we have. Uh, two major utilities and a bunch of municipalities, and they all have a, a differing amount of money um, to help you with installation. Uh, PG&E in California, going back to that last example, that was actually very specific to fleet electrification. Um, and we need more of those type of uh, programs, and I think they're coming uh, to help out with fleet electrification, so. Um. Uh, there's a question here. You may be getting up to this, but can Jack sit <laughs> can Jack sit down with us and help our help our partners help line up our partners? We currently have a fleet manager, or we currently uh, don't have a fleet manager, and we have only 15 vehicles. So, um, absolutely. You're there'll not going to turn, turn to the, the uh, there'll, there'll be a link at the end where you can get a hold of me. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah perfect. I would love to. Yeah, when you develop your team, you know, regardless of where you are, if you talk to your utility or you talk to your fleet management company or, or charging solution provider, we work with each other pretty much on a daily basis. So we'll be able to introduce who we partner with and who we're comfortable with. And your utilities can also make suggestions in your area. Um, and we'll be able to put a team together for you pretty easily. There's um, a couple technical questions that we'll have to get to after after the fact and um, individually. And we'll just we'll leave it at that. I think this is good. It's four minutes of. If anyone has anything else to add, we can um, we can reach out and discuss in a little bit. Otherwise, uh, thank you very much, everyone. I appreciate it. And Jack, um, it was great having you. Thanks, Chris and Caitlin. Appreciate the opportunity to, to jump in and good information. Thank you.